imaginatively titled Fantastic Queers and Where to Find Them, rather than Fantastic <laughs> Beasts. I think queers can be beastly too as well. Favourite kind of queer. Um, so we have got a wonderful array of authors to, uh, to speak to you today about fantasizing and fantasy creatures and queer peoples in novels and short stories and such. So, shall I let you introduce yourselves? Would you like to do that? Or not? No? Okay. <laughs> this is Jane Fletcher. Jane Fletcher writes lots of fabulous fantasy books that are nice thick tombs. Um, the wonderfully descriptive worlds that she builds in those fantasy books. Uh, and she's published by Bold Strokes Books. <laughs> Nita Round, I believe, is self-published, yes? Uh, no, it's re with Regal Crest until this month. Okay, so Regal Crest and then now you're self -published. No, it's Pink Tea Books. Oh, <laughs> have, you, have, you, have you traitored? <laughs> <laughs> so previously published by uh, Regal Crest Books, Nita Round, who writes wonderful fantasy type businesses and pirates and fabulous strong women. Uh, Mr. Matt Bright. <laughs> uh, because he's sandwiched between four women, um, we should, you know, give him a round of applause anyway. For him. <laughs> uh, so Matt writes all sorts of fabulous things, Steve Funk and, uh, and fantasy and such. Uh, and then we have Mrs. Emphasis on the Mrs. because she's my Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Bravelows. She's also published by Bold Strokes Books and mainly writes fantasy, although she does dabble in literary fiction and science fiction. <laughs> so we're going to start off. Me, uh, I'm Robin Nix. Um, I can't settle on a genre. I do romance and um, sci fi and thrillers and adventures and all sorts of stuff, but this fan is not about me, uh, so that's all you need to know. Uh, you can find out more about me tomorrow and Sunday, and then you'll be sick of hearing about me. Uh, so, we're going to start off with a little reading, and we're going to start off with our reluctant reader. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so you get it out of the way and just done. So, Nita's going to read from Raven, Fire and Ice, which is post-apocalyptic steampunk fair. Yes. So, to clap, please. And clap. I have to say, I don't normally have one genre I find all over the place, but uh, this is where we're at at the moment. So it's um, it's a post a pipe It's a post-apocalyptic world. It's good I take my glasses off. Can't see anyone anymore. Um, and it's the story in uh, in the start from the point of view of a character called Lucinda Ravensburg, who's a witch. Here we go. Uh, Lucinda Ravensburg sat at her desk and stared at the items she dumped on the leather writing surface. Money, a lot of it, spilled over several sheets of paper folded and sealed with wax. She selected one, broke the seal, and glanced at the writing inside. Pish, she grumbled, and discarded it. A flash of metal. A flash of pale metal in the shape of a hummingbird brooch caught her attention. She didn't touch it though. She just stared at the thumbnail sized work of art, crafted in silver and made with such skill and attention to detail, the hummingbird could have flitted its wings and flown away. Lucinda wondered who it had belonged to, or rather, who it had belonged to. She waited for inspiration or something to come to mind and nothing did. She'd have to touch it for that. When such inspiration failed her, she reached into the top left drawer of her desk, took out a leather-wrapped pouch, no longer the length and thickness of her hand, and inside lay three cylinders, the length of her index finger, each bar clipped in place with leather strapping. Lucinda selected one of these slender bars and tested the bone insert and brown rubber covering for blemishes. Satisfied with the integrity of the bar, she placed the cylinder between her teeth. She ground her jaws together until the bone and rubber sat comfortably in her mouth. Lucinda hated the bite bar, but better something that she disliked rather than risk the breaking a tooth or shredding her tongue. She took a deep breath and snatched at the silver brooch from the desk as though she feared it would burn. Her fingers closed around the little bird and her grip tightened into a fist. The muscles in her back stiffened, her perspective changed and her place in the chamber ceased to exist. 
Reality for Lucinda shifted elsewhere. Her room, the tower in which it lay, and the wall of her, all of her world vanished. Other images, memories not her own, assailed her mind. Blood, blood everywhere, fresh blood. Once white wall smears, smeared from floor to ceiling with shades of wine and scarlet. Blood and bandages, red on white. More details rose to her mind in little bubbles of vision. Eight little shower heads standing in a row. Drip, drip, drip. Blood fell in tiny, noisy drops. Copper pipes wrapped in slimy strings of gore shone with reflected light. Blood dripped into the pool with a steady plink, plink. At her feet, ripples spread out like a single drop of rain on a still and silent pool. Above her head, globules of slimy red and black clung to the ceiling with the tenacity of a banana. But banana, banana! <laughs> <laughs> Minions! Um, <laughs> With the tenacity of a barnacle, and once released, lands landed in the sea of blood with a solid blob. She saw movement then, neither a drip nor a splash this time. It rose from the flooded floor in a surge of red to stand dripping on two legs. A man, wide-eyed and staring, his pupilless eyes glowed with colours of deep shadow, and he opened a pus-filled mouth to reveal teeth pointed and ragged. He reached out with a claw-like hand and swiped with force and need, hungry. The words roared through her mind, along with pain and need, hunger most of all, and the hunger grew so great it tore at her insides. Feed me! The creature swiped at her again, a hand, hers and not hers, pushed out to fend off the attacker. He reached out, and this time a flash of silver fell from his long talons, long yellowed talons. A silver bird, tiny and perfect, glinted as it flipped over and over in a slow motion salt. She screamed, or she thought she heard a scream, in this place of memories. Her truth seemed hard to separate from the memories, the truth of others. When the screaming stopped, darkness came, and she sank into the wel welcome embrace of oblivion. And I'll stop there. Excellent. I should be picking a copy of that up later. Um, so you said you swapped genres. So what made you dabble in, in the fantasy? Well, I started with urban fantasy. I wrote a ghost story then. Uh, then I did a romance. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Raven Fire and I started out with a, uh, an exercise at a writing club. The perfect opening line. And the, the line I came out with, blood, blood everywhere. And that was it. And the, from there came a book. Right. So it doesn't take much, does it? <laughs> So, Jane, you write fantasy. Um, how did you sort of settle on that that genre? Was it natural? Those are the stories that I had. Mm. Um, more than I keep wanting to write some science fiction, but I never quite get the plot that I'm happy with. Whereas the fantasy plots are always fine, are much more straightforward. And how do you work out your your plots? Because I. Aren't you somebody that plots out everything, I, 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 every tiny detail? Yeah. Well, not every no, not every detail. I have all the major plot points. What causes things to happen? Everything should really go together in a chain. Like every new event should be caused by the ones that precede it. So it's not that detailed, but it is because this happens, that happens, and then that happens, and then that happens, yeah. and it makes a logical thing from the first initial start to the final climax. And, conclusion. Um, then I start breaking it down to make sure that I can, you know, dis I then decide on the scenes that will tell the story and make sure that everything fits into a scene. Yeah. Juggle things around from there. But it's not that detailed, but it is a complete nuts to butt soup. Nuts to soup? Yeah. <laughs> I've got no idea what that means. I'm going to Google that later. Right, it's um, oh, no, we'll leave you to that. Um, Jane, you write fantasy. Yes. Matt, would you like to tell us a bit about how, what kind of fantasy you like to write and why? Sure. Um, so, mainly what I write is um, short fiction. Um, I've spent like several years trying to play the short fiction game of sending it out to magazine after magazine after magazine, um, some of which have succeeded. Um, and it just kind of kind of ended up writing in the sort of I don't quite call it fantasy, but it's kind of spec big. It's all it's definitely within that on that boundary. Um, and I kind of ended up there by accident because I went off to uni, got taught to read and analyze only literary fiction until genre seemed like something that you should avoid. Um, and then consequently spent two years straight after university not reading anything, not writing anything, 
until eventually I started writing again. Then I sent something out, and then that got published, and that was spec fix. So I wrote more of that, and I kept going. Um, and so now, in October, I've got a collection of short stories coming out, which are all speculative fiction, um, apart from the odd few that I kind of had to take out for another little separate, like, secret book uh, that was separate. Um, secret book? Well, not a secret. Well, it's just a bit filthier than the, than the, yeah, <laughs> the spectacle. Oh, we all but, have uh, the filthy books. Yeah. Um, but, so it was kind of an accident, and then, like, five years later, that I now kind of squarely consider that that's my genre, that's why I know how to write, and now I don't like to write anything else because I've got to help. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, Bray. You focus mainly on fantasy. Um, so, well, um, you want to tell us how that how that happens, or you know how that how that came about? I think, like Jane, that's what I had. I loved my fantasy books when I was a kid. I loved all the Piers Anthony and, and Robert Heinlein kind of science fiction and, yeah. and ridiculous. Yeah. All of them. All of them. All, all of them. them. Yeah. Um, and so, because I loved to read it, I liked to write it. Um, and I like taking, I, like Matt too, it, it's more spec fic than, than pure fantasy, urban fantasy, um, making this world more magical than it, it is. Do you find that it's um, like an escape from reality for you, writing fantasy stuff? I'm going to start with Matt for that question. Um, I don't, I, for some of it, yeah. Um, definitely. So uh, there was an anthology I put out which was all steampunk and that particular genre I find to be a lot about escapism. There's a lot of other things within it, but that is very much kind of being able to transport yourself away to something different. Um, it tends to be a mix. Um, I just find that being able to write something with a, a magical or fantastical edge to it gives you that license to tell an experience or push a story something a little bit beyond what you feel like anchored in with real life, and uh, that's really helpful if you want to write queer characters a lot of the time, uh, which is what I always do, so it kind of gives you that extra license to push things like that. Um, and on a really kind of nuts and bolts level within publishing it, it's marginally easier to publish um, queer characters within the current sort of SF world than some of the other genres, only marginally, but it, it's just a bit of a leg up that helps. Um, I don't know it's, it, partly there's, there's a freedom to actually do what you want, but also in part you can use a fantasy, it's always obviously like science fiction, to actually give an alternate take on different issues. So like in the Selena series, having a women's only world, so that all the issues with sexism don't exist, being gay is no, being lesbian is not an issue in the book, but then what is an issue? And you know, what is that just to, to explore that writing world where there's no men? You don't even know it's possible to have male human beings. <laughs> um, in the Lionmouth series, I create a world where you have these people who are magic users, who are so powerful, who've had such an overwhelming effect on history and on society, that they're seen as being really different from everybody else. And like everybody else is bisexual, like, you know, because the difference between sorcerers and humans, or sorcerers and non-magical people is so great. You know, that to only be attracted to one sex, it's like saying you're only attracted to left-handed people. <laughs> Why? But then again, I have my main hero, who's a non-magic hero, who has a relationship with a sorcerer. And the problems that they go through in that relationship, is how their various groups see that. So it's just play with digitally, attacking the issues we know from a different angle that you can do in science. But that science fiction has been doing it forever. Fantasy tends to be much more conservative. But you can still tackle some of these issues from a totally different slant. Stand it on its head, how do you feel about the issue now? So it's not totally escapism. You can actually, a totally different slant on some issues. So following on from that, that was a nice little segue. Prompted a question. Um, what sort of issues have you dealt with in your fantasy books hmm. that are real life issues? Um, Stop. <laughs> Radio silence. I know I have. Yeah. Um, I think climate change is, is probably my favorite one that I've dealt with so far. Um, we were talking about that earlier, the, the issues of climate change and, and social economic status within that and what that's going to mean to our planet and, and what we're going to deal with. 
in Spinning Tales, I, I look at destiny and, and who, who plots your course and how much say do you have in your course. Um, and in my trilogy, I dealt with religion and politics and philosophy. Minor, minor topics. <laughs> light topics. Yeah, absolutely. What about um, you, Nitra? Have you felt the, the need to, to address reality in, in I, your books? Yeah, I do. But I, as Jane said, you, you cover issues that are uh, in this world, but you put a spin on it so it makes it different, so you can play, play about with it. And sometimes it's just about making shit up. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, and, and having fun with things that are different or the same that you want to make different. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, um, yeah, just this, you know, I, I like to, I prefer to be in another world where it's not, you know, not, none of this stuff. It's, mm -hmm. you know, the sky's pink or the grass is purple or something. Yeah, really weird stuff. That's nice. So, yeah. Okay, we'll have another little read in. I'm looking here, Mrs. Bray Willows, <laughs> if you'd like to read from your current book, Spinning Tales, yes. which is available at the back, you should be pleased to know. Um, so Spinning Tales is, was an experiment. I wanted to write a fairy tale about fairy tales, and just to see if I could do it. I don't know if I did, uh, but it was fun anyway. Maggie McShay is the main character, and she reads the want ads the old fashioned ones in the newspaper, uh, just as a voyeuristic kind of way to, to see the world. So this begins with a, a want ad. Wanted, single white female for unusual experience, cottage keeper for fairy tale home and highly desired location, must be quick thinking and resourceful, all expenses paid first year along with living stipend for the right person ready to make a real change. For interview, call It's Your Time 21. Maggie tapped on the ad while sipping her coffee. The alarm clock hadn't been necessary today since she'd spent all night tossing and turning. Thoughts of change and what she wanted to do with her life kept her from falling asleep. And when she did drift off, haunting images of forests and red eyes glaring at her through the leaves made her wake, her heart racing. Now, sitting with her coffee and looking over the personal ads, she kept rereading the strange little ad. Why would you need to be quick thinking to manage a house? Or what is a cottage? Beneath the questions later lay a flutter of excitement. Possibility beckoned. She stood and the cat gave a petulant grump when she moved the chair it was sprawled on. This is ridiculous, right? She directed her words at him, glad he couldn't respond, and asked questions she didn't want to answer. But if I could have an income and a place to live, maybe I could figure out where I want to go next. Bleck yawned and rolled over to put his back to her. She saw him eye a mouse who snuck out, grabbed a piece of Bleck's food, and darted under the cupboard. He barely twitched an ear. You're really a piece of work, you know that? She scratched his head and got the same amount of attention as the mouse. She grabbed her bag and headed to work, but all day long she couldn't get it out of her head. By the time she got home, she was almost breathless with unexplained anticipation. Instinct led her through the most difficult situations in her life, and now it was screaming for her to pay attention. She flipped open her laptop, logged on to the newspaper website, and sent a reply to It's Your Time 21, requesting an interview. Before she'd even checked her social media accounts, there was a reply inviting her to the cottage the next day. She jumped up and looked around, wanting to tell someone, but there wasn't anyone to tell. It was too late to call London, and her sister was probably off on her yacht or buying clothes or something, not that she'd be interested. The excitement waned slightly, but she went to bed feeling more hopeful than she had for a while. She'd been in one spot for over five years, her longest time anywhere since she'd left her adopted parents' house, and it was definitely time for something new. Um, so, Nita, you mentioned, or you, you both mentioned, about kind of writing fantasy because you'd read a lot of fantasy as, uh, as a child. The fantasy you read as a child, I imagine, was mostly heterosexual characters. Um, so, what is it about queering characters within your fantasy that um, you really enjoy? I think they, um, when I grew up, I read a lot of Marion Zimmer Bradley, and she has the renunciates of Dark Over. So there's Amazons everywhere. And so, um, and there was uh, a, a female gladiator um, in Warrior Woman. So there is lots of strong female characters throughout fantasy. And it's not so much about being queer, but 
being a strong woman and fantasy is one area in science fiction that allows strong women to exist without the necessity of a strong man to see them through. But it, so for me it was always about strong women rather than, than being queer. Obviously, own voice. Um, I want to talk about or I want to write about women who end up being with other women because that's, that's normal for me. So, um, and, and that, that is where, yeah, I also read a lot of crime, but there's not a lot of queering in crime unless they're dead. <laughs> yeah, don't get me started on that. Um, <laughs> um, Matt, so what about you? Did you read a lot of fantasy as a, as a youngster? I read a lot, yeah, a lot. Um, like I still have like a manuscript that I wrote when I was 14 that was like the beginning of an epic fantasy novel. Um, never read stuff you read when you were <laughs> But I read a lot of that and it wasn't, that was looking back incredibly heterosexual. It didn't really stand out to me as that, except that when I was, I guess I must have been about 15, I got out from the library Clive Barker's, like selected Clive Barker. Uh, I read a couple of his stories and that had an effect. That blew my mind. That was quite a massive U-turn from the, uh, a lot of the other stuff I was reading, but um, all of that, like, like I sort of said, when I went off and started studying it, we were kind of pushed away from the genre, so when it, it always, all the kind of fantasy stuff that I read always struck me at the time incorrectly, but as just sort of, I guess, slightly trivial, and it wasn't until a long time afterwards that I came back to it and realised that, that it was anything but, and happened to kind of hit the time where a lot of other queer writers are coming up and writing, there's a lot of kind of sci-fi and, and spec fake writing that's coming out, so much so that we've had a lot of the backlash from, um, from various groups who think that uh, fantasy and sci-fi is now too about social justice, etc., um, which is absurd. So it kind of combined, I got to go from thinking of fantasy and all the things I read as just this thing that was off to the side, and then when it, when it all kind of, when I came back to the genre, it was along with all the kind of queer writers that are doing lots and lots of interesting things with their characters and things in it. So it kind of is all combined in my head. That's what's exciting about it now that I've rejoined the fold, as it were. <laughs> Jane, what about you? When I was young, first thing I really went to reading was mythology. But that's only reading historic fiction. I mean, Rosemary Sutcliffe was my favourite author when I'm you're talking about 19, 11. Um, I started reading science fiction. Yeah, I don't know quite how to writing fantasy. I mean, I enjoyed fantasy, and obviously, I mean, I'm reading the, the Narnia books I remember reading. Um, why writing gay characters? Partly because I'm bored with straight ones. There are just so many of them, you know. I mean, I've watched television, and it's really fun to me. Well, Joe and I were watching Battlestar Galactic at the moment. It's great, but there's just so much heterosexuality. Um, it's just nice to have something a bit different. I think it's important to me, not not to make a big deal out of the main gang. I think some of the other panels we've had have been talking about normaliz normalizing things. So not a big deal that they are gay, but that they're gay, <laughs> that they're they're queer people having adventures and and being out there and doing things. Like Jane says, there's lots and lots of of heterosexual people out there. I want to see gay people doing things and, and relate to that and enjoy it on that level. Um, I read plenty of, of other books that don't have queer characters, but I want to write books for people who want to see themselves on the page. Jane, would you like to read your little excerpt? This is from The Shoe Stone, which came out actually here before last. But we've still got a couple of copies at the back there. Uh, it's just from the front. The boy laughed in Matt's face. Give me that. It's mine. No, it's not. You stole it. So what if that was true? He wasn't the one Matt had stolen the fish from and he had no right to take it. She took a step back, clenching the fist to her chest. The boy was at least four years older than Matt and a foot taller, with straight black hair, dark brown eyes and light brown skin. He was scrawny, dressed in rags so tattered you could count three ribs in the gap between his shirt and pants. His face was screwed in a mean, hard sneer. In short, he looked just like all the other street children, just like Matt herself. Except Matt knew she was just that bit hungrier. The last time she would eat, had eaten was the morning before, a few cabbage leaves scavenged from the market. 
Today she'd been watching fishermen unloading the boat when they were distracted by a drunken brawl. It was her chance to snatch a fish and make off. Despite being raw, it was the nearest thing to a decent meal she'd seen all month, and Matt wasn't about to give it up. A sound of movement stopped Matt before she took another step, and the boy's sneer got broader. He wasn't alone. Matt twisted to look over at back. Two of his friends stood there, posing like grown-up rowdy boys. All were bigger than Matt. Even one-on-one -on -one should stand no chance in a fight, but could they outrun her? The leader was a soft target. Matt could read him easily. A blowhard who thought she'd roll over and give up. A puffed up bully when our numbers were on his side. His friends were too dim to do anything other than follow. Matt let her shoulder slump, enough to let him think he'd, he'd won. Then she charged, driving her elbow into his stomach. He curled forward his mouth in a big circle like he was about to spew. Matt threw everything she had into a roundhouse kick behind his knees, taking his feet from under him, and then she was off. <laughs> Uh, do you have any questions from the audience yet? You're feeling brave? <laughs> no? Not yet? Okay, uh, Matt. Who is or what is, the fa is your favourite character that you've created in a fantasy short story or something? Um, <sighs> <sighs> <Bloody> hell, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's a really hard question. <laughs> um, Choose your favourite child. <laughs> <laughs> I think, so, um, probably, it's not necessarily quite my favourite um, character, but it's the world that I, I kind of made around it um, from the piece that I read um, a little later, and it's, it was an idea I had of um, this library in which every book that has ever been lost completely ends up um, in this library, and it's, it's ruled over by this slightly sinister librarian who um, doesn't allow you to read the books, um, you can only collect them, you can't touch them, etc. And the main character within the story kind of is there trying to infiltrate it, trying to steal the book. Um, and when I wrote it, it, it ended up being cut down and cut down and cut down because I started in this world and then it got bigger and it got bigger and it got bigger and I had the library of lost music and the library of and all these other things and this, this romance that was in there with a boy who played the violin over in the library and then I had to cut it all out because it was just way, way too much of it. And the idea, the librarian is sort of the villain character, but I just, I like the potential, the ideas, and all the things that can come from that, which I keep meaning, keep starting, and then not writing much more of it. And there is eventually going to be more of it coming, but it's, it's, I just love that, the idea of all these things, this, this collection, and this person who has all these things at their fingertips, and all the stories that you can tell with that, and that's why I kind of really like all the places that it can go. I've got. No, I can't, all the rest of my level. And I'm going to pause the, the answers on that because that's a nice segue into your reading. Okay. <laughs> library of Lost Things. Cool. Um, so I wrote this story as a birthday present for my publisher. Um, and he, uh, Steve Berman, he makes a cameo in it. Um, and true to, true to everything about him, he gave me it back two days later with edits um, after his birthday. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks to his edits, um, many of which we argued about, and we still keep tally in, in the Goodreads reviews about like if someone says they like a certain line, whether it's his line or my line. Um, but thanks to his edits, I do genuinely mean thanks to his edits, um, it ended up selling to Tor.com, which was like the top of my bucket list of places to sell, bought by Anne Vandermeer, which was also so exciting that I actually had the email framed, um, just because of her name that's on there. Um, and it took like four years before it came out because that's what Tordicom's like. So this was written a really long time ago, but eventually um, kind of came out last year, two years ago. And it will also be in my collections out in October just to get the plug in there. But um, I'll read the opening of this. So. The librarian turned his eyes upon me, reversed the single sheet of paper once, and then neatly back again. An excellent candidate, he said. And Thomas Hardy, Appropriate name. We have one of his, you know. No relation, I assume. And then. Favourite grammatical form, passive voice. He looked me up and down, pinprick eyes narrowed and licked his dry bottom lip. Marvellous. Sir, I said. The librarian's tongue flickered. So wonderfully uninterested. Most boys, well, they come here with their nasty adverbs and their present tense, or God forbid, second person. <laughs> 
When he shuddered, his spine cracked like an old hardback opened in one swift, cruel motion. Quite unsuitable. You, on the other hand. And then, after some deliberation, very well. The job is yours, young Thomas. Tom, I said, and swallowed with relief that he hadn't asked me why I wanted to work for the library. I prepared a response, but I doubted it would impress. The librarian's eyes were sharp and astute, shadowed in the hollows beneath a foxed brow. He would have picked apart my half-truths, separating non-fiction from fiction, and, suspicious, sniffed around the superlative adjectives. Come along. He unfolded his eight-foot frame from the armchair, a stick insect stretching. He led me out of his office, down a long hall which echoed our footsteps, and to a set of ornate double doors. Through here, he said, is the main hall of the library. You must always treat this place with the utmost respect. We serve a greater good. Stay long and you will know this. He guided me through the doors. On the other side, bookshelves reached the horizon. The librarian bent close to my ear. He reeked like a damp second-hand bookshop or comic books left to moulder in the bottom of a wardrobe. How would you describe it, Tom? I was still being tested. The interview was not truly over. Perhaps it never would be. I looked from one behemoth shelf to the next. It was a graveyard of spines, leather, paper, string, the wormed carcasses of all those books buried next to each other, one after another, into the dark. The feeling of disintegrated sentences hung in the air, a deadness of language, like a word abandoned mid-syllable. It's impressive, I said. Impressive. <laughs> The librarian outstretched his arms to the expectant hall. It takes you three syllables to encompass all of this. I had been memorising Roger's 1911. Large, I said. <laughs> he chuckled. Better to be faced with an eternity of literature and render it down to one uttered word, one brief sound. Large. I think you'll be perfect. From beneath the shelf, peeling grimoires, uh, scratchy muttered sounds could be heard. At first, I interpreted them as squeaks, then realised instead that they were voices. Words, I realised. Stripling, gangle, pill garlic. A scurry of grey, tiny shapes crossed our path and disappeared amongst the nearest bookshelf. <laughs> Ignore the rats, the librarian said. So bothersome. I tried to keep them away from the books, but they overrun the place. They have a particular taste for the folios. I suppose it's only natural they picked up some words. <laughs> but such bothersome words. <laughs> He licked a spindly forefinger and thumbed his lapel as if he could turn the page of his suit. To work then, my unremarkable boy. We shall all find that in October as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now you've had time to think about your favourite character. Mrs. Willows, what is your favourite character? I think... And what? <laughs> <laughs> Um, the trilogy that I did with the, the Furies, the Greek Furies, um, the, each book follows one Fury, but they all have a romantic interest. And in the third book, the, the love interest is death. And I, I think I really love death. Yeah. <laughs> um, she's, uh, she's just really lovely and really sweet. And, and I, I, yeah, I just love her. And the way that she wants to redo hell, or rather death, um, so that it's not so scary. I think it's just really sweet. And she surfs. A surfing death. I think it's, <laughs> I think it's just lovely. <laughs> yeah, for me, it'd be death. Rita, what about you? Um, I love all my characters, but I think the one that is, it's, it's going to be the one I'm writing about at the moment. Um, in A Touch of Truth, it's going to be eight, eight books long, but it intersects with another series at book five. So I'm writing another story with a character called Evie Chester, which is in that short story. And because of that, she's grown into quite, uh, quite a presence. Uh, and Evie Chester is, is a gifted woman who is, who is considered to be a healer, but she isn't. She's a conduit. She will take whatever is in you, pull it out and hold it inside herself. So if you're sick, she takes out. If you're sad, She'll take that. If you've got a bad memory, she'll take that. And then she has to get rid of it because otherwise it's... No, I can't tell you all of that because that's the story. <laughs> but she, she's a feisty character who has a very 
poor start and becomes quite a big power by the time she intersects with the touch of truth. So she's my favourite. She's my baby. <laughs> and you'll be able to see that character in the short story. In the short story. Be in, released in an anthology around August, September time, which came from Elcon last it's year. It's what it did, yes. <laughs> Jane, how about you? It's hard, but possibly Ellen from Shadow of the Knife. Just because I tend to have coming of age stories, by, not intentionally, it just you know, happens. And Ellen's is it to the extreme. I mean, the character by the end is not the character that started. And that growth that she goes through, uh, Kurt did some pretty nasty experiences along the way. Um, yeah. It's probably how the character matures in the course of one book. That's what I'm fond of. So, so you can all think about it. What's the coolest thing or the best thing a reader has ever said to you about one of your fantasy books or a character in your fantasy books or something that the, a reader's done as a result of something in your books? Oh, oh me. <laughs> <laughs> girls came up and um, one of them showed me a picture of the wings off of my afterlife books and she said I've designed these because she's gonna get them tattooed because she loved the book so much that she's having all the wings of your theories tattooed on her. Wow. Yes. <laughs> Marked! <Yeah. laughs> Mine! <laughs> someone who uh, said that story again. It's not the only thing I've written, I promise, but that story, um, that they wanted it to be filmed by Tim Burton. Um, and that, that was uh, that was what they pictured. Hopefully early Tim Burton, not late Tim Burton, but... <laughs> um, no but that's... It, a, it's really cool because then your brain spins off into imagining that for us because it's what I was aiming for, so it's like, oh, thank God, someone someone got it, um, which is good. That's, that's mine. That's good. It's not a tattoo. That's good, yeah. You too? There's two things, really. Oh, you're only allowed one. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make that into a story, then. Um, um, one is that just, you know when you're writing that you, you feel somewhat despondent with nobody likes it, it's all shit, that sort of thing. And then someone comes every along, time. yeah, I'm every five minutes, yeah. and then someone comes along, that I had a, a text message only a few days ago, and it, were, and it was um, a a friend of mine and she said, well she's a friend of mine now that she's read, read my books, she said, it never, every time I reread your books it never ceases to amaze me how uh, wonderful they are and I think, well, fuck. Um, <laughs> um, we'll bleep that. Yeah. <laughs> I've been good so far, it's only one. Um, and then I was talking to some steampunkers a little while ago and one of the women there has renamed herself Lucinda Ravensburg. Oh. And he's going to play all the characters in a series. In, well, not all the characters, but she's going to play the one character in a in a, a in a photo shoot that is based on that. Wow, it's very cool. weird, wow. really. If you cool. uh, yeah, if you if you if you um, go on Facebook and type in Lucinda Ravensburg, bang, there she is. <laughs> it is weird. <laughs> it's a living embodiment of a character. Yeah, yeah. So it's so it's like, I've got photos and everything. <laughs> and are you happy then? I mean, because obviously when you, you think of characters, you have a picture of them in your head. She's, she's she embody your character. Yeah, she's not... Uh, some of the features are not quite right, but the way that she is, it's, which is like a, in Victorian dress and very proper and very prim, that is, that is Lucinda. Well, there's always plastic surgery in there. Some of the dentists would do it, you know. Hair, dye her hair, I don't care. Uh, so, um, yeah. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Thank you. And Jay? Yeah, a bit. It's not any one person I say this, but it's the day you're sort of sitting there, you're trying to write, and it's just not working, and I think it's crap. And I read back where I read the day before and thought, this is awful. And I'm sitting there totally miserable, and I'll get the email from fans saying, I really love your work. And that is the most amazing lift. Cheers. And, uh, so I go have a cup of tea and carry on writing. Yeah. <laughs> so you two had two, can I have two? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, the only 
go to the audience thing, because you have two. Yeah. 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 Um when somebody when my third one came out and and I was feeling like these books are shit and <laughs> I, why did I ever sit down to write? And somebody came in and said, I loved those books. It's like American Gods for Lesbians. Main lesson there clearly is always tell writers that you like their stuff. We really need it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I was, I was going to pick up from that because everybody's kind of said, when I'm writing, I'm thinking, oh my god, this is this is shit. So what what keeps you writing? Because obviously you're on your sixth book. Um, you must be on twelve. Yeah. The, I'm sure I've got the contract. What will be my thirteen? X. Oh, so I'm lucky thirteen. Yeah. Uh, so you know, you're all multi-published. So what keeps you going back for that? I mean, are you, are you just masochists? What, what's, the, what's the deal? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the other book, though. <laughs> that's, that's the secret book. Uh, so let's start with you, Matt. It's just worth it. That's yeah. the, the short version. In the end, it's worth it when it's published. Um, and to have readers, even to not have readers, even as long as you've created it and it's kind of out there, it is a lot nicer when you have readers. That does help. But um, I don't know. I've got bizarre, a bizarrely thick skin for... Because like I said, I'm constantly playing sh the short fiction game of sending stuff out and that means you get a lot of rejections and I have a bizarrely thick skin for that. I will turn around 10 minutes afterwards and I've got like a lot in 10 minutes of sadness and then it sort of goes out somewhere else. Um, but writing, when I'm actually writing, it just, it's like a constant cycle of, you have to have this bizarre kind of, you have to think it's genius and absolutely crap at the same time and you have to be able to think both of those. Otherwise, you A, wouldn't write it, but then you also wouldn't be critical. It's this weird balancing act of both. Um, and normally, you write it, you think it's a bit crap, and then you come back to it a little bit later, and you find what's good in it. Um, unless you're writing on a deadline, and then you have to do them both in your head at the same time. Um, which, so, the collection is out in October, I had to hit a, a deadline at the end of, of April, and I was writing something approaching 7,000 words a day, and they were crap, trust me. <laughs> 7,000 words a day were crap. But having to then, <laughs> But then do that, that the mental gymnastics super fast because normally it takes a week and I had to like do it in like half an hour and go from like this is awful right okay but now go back and now I think it's genius and then hopefully you equal out somewhere in the middle hopefully I like the way you describe that and I don't think I've never heard that that dichotomy between the it's total crap and it's genius at the same time yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that's, that's fair for you yeah that's a good way of putting it uh, Jane. I'm, I'm not a natural writer. You get some people say that they have to write, you know, they'd go crazy if they didn't write. I could stop writing. Um, I find writing hard work. I don't enjoy writing, but I love having written. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like I'm like finishing a book, and when are you going to get it published? And you actually hold it in your hands. But, you know, it's about you know, the marathon run, it's talking about the endorphin high. Mm -hmm. It's the literary equivalent. Yeah. And do you read your own books once they're finished? Or I used you to, I, I no longer do, but uh, I sit and smile at them for a while. And <laughs> 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 just grin at them. Yeah. <laughs> Run your fingers along the nice spines. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Nita, what about yourself? I love to write. Yeah. I, I can't not write. If I stop writing, I'm a misery to live with. Um, because of nodding her head. Um, because Whilst I'm writing, I, it means I can focus on one thing. I, and I'm a pantster, so I have no plotting. It just, out it comes, two or three thousand words a day. But it, it, and if I'm lucky, then I don't have to edit those words. They will go, at the end, straight to the beta reader. Um, but if I stop writing, then other ideas start to crowd in. And the more I stop, the more the idea, oh, that's a good idea, oh, shiny idea, oh. I, and it, it drives me completely insane. Because I, then the, these characters take your mind so fully that sometimes you don't know if they're real or they're just make-believe. So I have conversations with my wife about a conversation I've had with a character. And she's, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> of course you do. We were talking about it yesterday. At least you don't mix the names up. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Grounds for divorce. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I have to, and it's, it's, but even so, it's still not, not easy getting the words out. You know what's going on in your head, but translating an activity in there into some black and white on a screen or a piece of paper, that, that is hard, harder. Making it make sense is, is 
is the next level of heart. <laughs> and then you cry. <laughs> From that slightly. The, the, the thing that you're avoiding is what I do to get things done. So I have a million and one projects, so that I, like, if I'm procrastinating, at least I'm procrastinating on something else. And then eventually okay. everything yeah. gets done. That's, that's I found the solution. You never turn anything on deadline, but you eventually turn everything in quite some time afterwards. <laughs> I used to be like that, but I've no, nothing ever got finished. So now I focus on one. I, I do play five games at once, though. <laughs> there you are, that's your outlet for that. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. write a sentence, or, pff, play that game, yeah. uh, come back, <laughs> play that game, and then come back again. <laughs> Bray, how do you keep writing in the face of such self-doubt? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I... Mm. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. I keep... I guess I've come up with, with ideas. I mean, the, the trilogy was in my head for a long time. It had to come out, because it had been there for years. So that, that needed to come out. And then the, the couple books the three books that have come after, um, I think two of them came to me in a dream. And they were so fully formed that it was easier to write them. Um, I don't know. I'm an editor first. Like Jane said, I could stop writing. I'm an editor first and a writer second. I couldn't stop being an editor. I love what I do. But the story has to be there for me. And if it's not there, I have nothing to write, which is why I'm switching up for a little while and, and doing some mainstream literary fiction stuff, because right now there simply isn't a, a queer story in my head. You make me too happy. <laughs> if you make me miserable, I think I can write better. <laughs> oh, then I'll work on it. Poetry miserable. Yeah, yeah. 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 Or you've learned how to fish. Or learn to fish. And I, I'm a vegetarian, so that would be really something. <laughs> <laughs> just be a line without a hook. <laughs> Is anybody figuring out that I'm, I'm an imposter here? <laughs> I could just do an imaginary line. Yeah. People just think you were crazy. I think this is derailing. It is. Does so anybody have any questions? <laughs> yes. Um, I just wondered about a um, routine and like how you fit it into your day and your life in terms of like getting the writing done. You have no friends. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start with you then, Bray. <laughs> um, it, it has to be really structured, I think, for me. I'm, not, I'm a procrastinator, so I'll put stuff off forever. So if, if I need to get a novel done, I carve out the time and I am, it is sacred. I have two hours at night where I write, and that's it. Um, and nothing, I don't do other things. I don't do laundry, I don't, I don't clean the house, I don't, you know, all the other things that you could possibly do. <laughs> I, I don't do them. I um, starve. <laughs> For you. She doesn't make brownies or nothing. I see Facebook. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think you, you Create the space for it. If you want to do it, you have to make it happen. If there are no words to fix, then you, you, there's nowhere to go. So at least sit down and, I think the one thing I always say is give yourself permission to write crap. <laughs> to just get it out and not think that it has to be perfect or amazing, the first draft, but get it out. Excellent. Jay? Um, I'm a haphazard binge writer. When I'll get the plot, and I'll go months of time, I'm not writing anything. Um, I'm not writing anything. Obviously, not, not literally at the moment, but in the last few weeks, I've not written anything. But I will, I'll have the plot, and I'll mull it over. I'm hiking around, and once I've actually got the plot, I'll sit. And then usually in the space, it takes me, you know, hopefully three months or so to actually knock out a first draft. Uh, being retired helps a lot on that. <laughs> because then I, and it's usually winter months. And that leaves my summer's free to gallivant around the world. <laughs> I am hideously bad at getting it into a routine. Um, but when I do successfully write, it is about making the space for it and making it more important than everything else. Or well, not everything else, but whatever it needs yeah, to be more everything. important than everything. <laughs> everything. Yeah. Like your spouse doesn't need to be like nothing. Um, <laughs> and, 
the the thing that I actually when I can get into a routine, the thing I do find helpful is um, for me is to have different projects and not feel the need to do a lot on one thing and constantly try and keep up. Um, you normally, it's it's a marathon. You do have to keep going and doing. And the best way that I do is to have a couple of things, and I will spend a short amount of time on this one today, and a short amount of time on that one, and this one, and then eventually you kind of get there. It takes longer to get to everything, but you do kind of in the end produce the same amount of things. That said, I'm still terrible with it, and I will go months without doing anything that I should be doing. But the underlying note is I should be doing it, but just not doing it. But yeah. Peter, what about you? Do you have a schedule? Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, I get up and I start to write first thing. Sometimes I even have breakfast. Um, sometimes I don't. Uh, sometimes I even get dressed. Um, <laughs> and then I write. There's a mental picture for your audience. No, don't. <laughs> don't, don't. don't. Uh, then I stop when the dog tells me she wants to walk. Um, and they come back and have some lunch. And then I find that after the first morning session, then I'm a little bit lackadaisy. But about four o'clock when I'm supposed to be cooking dinner, that's when I usually get my second wind and then it's <laughs> and, uh, frenetic typing. That's what she says, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't possibly make you dinner, darling. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and. <laughs> no, she wants to know how many words I've done so that I have to. Uh -huh. I have to win. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then I, I usually do a couple of hours in the evening. Um, if not writing, it might be research. So I, I, I research a lot when I'm when I'm working. So I probably do about ten hours a day at, at my desk, research as well as writing and editing. Yeah, I think on that the main thing is to find a schedule that suits yourself, but but try and build it up. So if you're if you're not writing anything and you're finding that life just takes over because it can, then set yourself a couple of hours just for <laughs> one day a week and then make sure you sit your ass down in the chair every time, every day that time, you know, every day at that time, um, and then just build it up steadily and steadily until it gets into a habit. And then um, you're a hermit. Yeah. <laughs> 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 do when I'm writing is that the word count, and uh, each morning I would look back how much I wrote the day before, and yeah. I put a little note on, on the doc, word doc, what the word count was, and when I finished that day I would check and just see, and if I've done under 2,000 words, I know I've been lollygagging around. <laughs> <laughs> so, one last question? I have one, yes. Yeah. Uh, I, like, I love reading fantasy and sci-fi, but and, uh, the, to me, the crucial uh, part of it, to the success of it and credibility of it, is world building. And um, how important is it, actually, because all of you write it, and you spend a lot of time in uh, building the work behind it, although a lot of it might not make it to the page. Okay. Should we start with you, Nita, on that one? Um, the truth series, I've got a Bible, a book Bible, it's that thick, with A4 a sheets of paper with all the world's building notes. So I know, um, the only one thing I haven't done is the days of the week. I don't know why, I just didn't, didn't think about it. But um, I have maps of the world, I have the countryside, I have how religion works, I have the political structure of every major continent, I have the political leaders of every major continent, I've got the currency sorted, the climate, the local area maps where they go, the technology, how the technology works, all of it, it's all in a great big file. I've got one sheet for characters, the rest is, <laughs> <laughs> the rest is all there, but they are fully formed so I know what they, what they do. Um, um, but yeah, lots and lots of world building is it's essential. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jane? Uh, nothing like that detailed. Um, basically, in that number of worlds that I've worked with, um, you do need to make it, it needs to be coherent. That actually is the issue. And that's one of the things that I can, when you're reading some fantasy novels that can jump out of it, and the pattern that people are going through the desert and they get attacked by this large monster. And you kind of think, well, what does it eat when there's no caravans yeah, going the through? <laughs> <laughs> you actually need to have coherent in the end. We just do know if it does. Yeah, or not it, it's mistakes like that, you, and you can do it in all sorts of things. You know, you can have the technology wrong. You know, that there's something, and that there's nothing to support economically steel mills, and you've got people wearing armour, and that's going to jolt your reader out. Um, I, I create the world that does. I, I create the wor world to the plot. Like, what does the plot need? What elements? And then what justification can I have that has these elements in the world? 
and can I make it rational? And if I can't make it rational, I need to go away and redo something. Um, it's pretty much the way that I do character. And some say the, the, the extent that the world is a character. In that I, I want someone who's going to do this, 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 and this, and think, well, what sort of person could do it? And if you come at the conclusion that no human being would ever do that, then you need to go away and redo it because you haven't got a believable character. And the same thing goes for a world. What history could make this world work this way that the story needs? And if I can't do that, then I need to go away and rework on the plot because I am working on plot first rather than the world. Um, I think I have a sort of slightly different perspective in that what I write predominantly in a minute is short fiction and what I do aside from that is editing um, on anthologies and short fiction. So it's often, um, as a reader, I do love stories that have a big rich world in it, but the emphasis there is on, is on rich. I want to be able to feel it and not necessarily have to know every detail. But as the writer, you normally have a load of stuff that's under the surface that you know, um, it's just not there. The problem comes, I think, from a sort of editing side is that you will see, um, especially within short fiction, where you've got, let's say, for example, a 10, a ten page story and four pages is plot and six pages is just telling you the world. Um, within short fiction, it's, it's a little bit different. You've got to try and evoke it with the smallest amount of detail possible. It's like the kind of almost the opposite um, skill and it's hard to do. Um, and it's really hard to do when you know you should be doing it. Half of, half of my editing is taking stuff out and stuff like they don't need to know that. Um, but to me, it's always about, it is about the, the writer knowing what, they, what they're trying to create and making the, the reader feel it. Um, and if what the writer needs is to know all those details behind it, then so be it. If they don't, if they can just pull it together from a few details. But I think that is not completely, but certainly in some way specific to short fiction, because you have such a short space to do it, you need to make people feel rather than sort of explain, if that makes sense. But, um, I tried to take that skill into into novel writing as well, but having not yet finished one, I'm not gonna <laughs> I'm not gonna speak yeah. claim any we've well, done that one. Andre, what about your world? Yeah, I think that's why I like speculative fiction because it's the world we know, <laughs> so I get to play with kind of this world and just expand on it. Um, so I can take elements of of what we've already got and just play with it. I my next book is a science fiction where I had to create a whole new world. And God, that was hard. Yeah, that's the impression I have, yeah. Oh, because you have, you have all this knowledge behind the scenes, mm. which rarely makes it into the book, but you do need to have it there, right? The ridicu it was a ridiculous amount of research. <laughs> and, and why does this plant grow here and not there, and, and animals and things? And, oh, I'll never do it again. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's my answer. It is hard. <laughs> Oh, definitely, I'm going to stick with the world we know. <laughs> I, I play Dungeons and Dragons, a various other games, so I'm the DM, so I create these worlds as a, as a matter of course. So the fact that you can stick some characters in and write a story, I've already got the world. It just, um, so for me, the world building is fascinating, but you don't get the word count. Um. If you get the words, <laughs> <laughs> you're still only with 45,000 yeah. words on a world, but no, no story. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, if we can um, give a nice little round of applause to our esteemed panel.